Hello everybody and good morning. It's good to be with you this Pentecost Sunday and a bit later Pam is going to be talking to us from that brilliant chapter in Acts, Acts chapter 2, that describes a time when all those listening in Jerusalem were given the opportunity and able to hear God speak to them in their own language. And it got me thinking this week um, how true it is in the Bible when it says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. Because here we are now, centuries later, and God is still wanting to speak to each of us. And as we listen, he'll speak in ways that suit our own individual needs and feelings, ways that are just right for each one of us. He speaks in our own language. I don't know how many of you have been listening and watching to the UK blessing that was produced by loads and loads of different churches throughout the UK and how great it is um, as you listen to that, I've listened to it loads of times actually, um, how great it is that the words that echo from that are, he is for us, God is for us. And just as we today are thinking about the time when the Holy Spirit was able to bring hope, was able to bring blessing, was able to bring courage to Peter and all the other disciples. So we too are in a position to benefit from the Holy Spirit speaking to us individually through the words of scripture. And I thought I would use those words of scripture to continue um, to lead us into worship as we say, may the Lord bless us as we come to worship. May the Lord keep us as we continue in worship. May the Lord turn his face to shine upon us as we rest in worship. And may the Lord turn his countenance to us and give us peace through our worship. Amen. The Bible reading is from Acts chapter 2 verses 1 to 21. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, 
What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. Hello, today we are going to be talking about this three-leaf clover. It can represent how we think about God. The God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Today we are going to be focusing on God the Holy Spirit. The disciples were waiting in the upstairs room of the house, waiting for Jesus' promised helper. It came to them in the form of wind and fire. Today we are making fiery spinners that twirl in the wind because it is Pentecost. First of all, you need a piece of card. Um, we've actually found some card, but the first one's made out of cereal boxes and they were absolutely fine. So anything that you've got lying around. Um, so you need to draw around a plate. <laughs> Come on. There you are. Keep a steady hand. Doesn't matter if you have a few little wobbles along the way. Oh, Voila. You. Now you can cut it out. When using scissors, be sure to get some adult supervision. When they're nice and dry, you need to get somebody to just make a hole for you in the top bit. So that you can thread some string through. Oh, and you can add extra decoration if you'd like. I added this 3D paint. 3D paint, which is going to be brilliant. And we did paint both sides because we had the time to do that. And then you thread. string through, tie a knot, can't tie a knot by yourself, always ask for help, and there you have it.
Heavenly Father, thank you that fire and wind can remind us that you sent the power of your Holy Spirit for us all at Pentecost. Amen. Hello. Happy Pentecost. I know, it sounds strange, doesn't it? Not like Happy Christmas or Happy Easter. Yes, it's the third of three Christian festivals we have each year. Or rather, it's really not just Happy Pentecost, but it's a time of the coming of God's Spirit. But hang on a minute. Wasn't God's Spirit around anyway? Well, yes, of course. The very beginning of our Bibles tells us that the beginning of time... When everything was formless, God's Spirit moved along the surface of the water. And then God's Spirit moved in particular individuals, like a musician, or a craftsman working with silver, or a prophet, or three. And by the time we reach the New Testament, we have Mary with the news that she's going to mother this unusual child, the child of God. She erupts in a spirit-filled ecstasy, that we call the Magnificat. Then we find Jesus as an adult baptised in the River Jordan. He is touched by the Spirit as he comes up out of the water. And then only a short while later, at what we describe the beginning of his ministry, when he's in Capernaum at the synagogue, he's invited to read from the prophet Isaiah. He opens the scroll at Isaiah 61 and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me and has anointed me to preach good news to the poor to recover sight for the blind, to heal the brokenhearted and set the prisoner free. And then Jesus said, Today this comes true in me. Okay, so the Spirit's at large. So why are we talking about the Spirit coming at Pentecost? Why is that so special? Let's have a look at what happened. There are about 120 believers at that time. They've gathered together. They'll have heard the news about Jesus Christ, died on a cross, yet rose again. They've heard various stories from various of the disciples and other wanderers and travellers. And they're all there now, agog, waiting, open, wondering, praying, ready for whatever God might do. And we have three senses. The first thing is what they hear. They hear a sound like a rushing wind. Now that should have given them a clue. Because when we look at wind, we look at the word pneuma in the New Testament, P-N-E-U-M-A, pneuma, from which we get pneumatic, as in tyres, filled with air. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, the word is ruach. So it's ruach or, or pneuma, it means wind, spirit, breath. So the fact that there was the sound of rushing wind sort of hinted that this was something of God they'd encountered before. The second sense was seeing, and they saw flames. And these flames seemed to separate and settle on the heads of the, of the twelve disciples. This too should have been a clue. After all, they would know the story of Moses, of how for God to get his attention, wandering as he did with the flocks, he suddenly saw a burning bush. And yet, although the bush was afire, it wasn't burning up. The leaves were still green. It was still fresh and alive. And that's what was happening here. This flame that was in their midst and touching the heads of the disciples wasn't singeing their hair or setting their clothes on fire. Hearing, seeing, and then speech. Alarming, strange, peculiar sounds that filled some with laughter. And others were saying, but wait a minute. He is local, but he's speaking my language, and I've travelled 250 miles to come here. They were stunned. This was different. So those followers, those 120 that gathered there that day, they would go home changed. They would be sharing what they'd experienced with their family and their friends, the believers back home who couldn't make the journey. They'd been there. They knew. They would not forget. They would never be the same again. 
it was as though this spirit wasn't just more of the same, but an explosion of God's spirit. And now I'm, I can't help but think about those firework displays we have on New Year's Eve. You know, when everybody's crowding the Thames Embankment and they're all watching in, in the dark and they're agog and waiting and watching and wondering how long it will be before they start. And then suddenly those tiny little sparks, myriad of them, shoot up into the sky. And the next thing is they erupt like what we now call chrysanthemums of coloured sparks all coming down in a wonderful mixture looking as though they're heading for the very heads of the people who are watching, the crowd that's going, ooh, and ah. But there the similarity ends. Because within a few minutes, that display has come to an end. If you like, you could say millions of pounds worth of fireworks have gone up in smoke. But God's spirit is different, powerful, there for all time. So what about the disciples? They'd been used to surely some of God's spirit through Jesus. Why did they need this sudden influx, of this powerful spirit? They'd seen it at work in Jesus. They'd heard what he'd said. They'd listened to his explanations. They'd smiled at his stories. They'd seen him at work. They'd seen the miracles. Lame people walk. Blind people see. Dead people live again. Storm. Quelled. Of course, the cross had happened, and they were devastated. But then by the third day, Jesus was alive again. Alive? Dead people don't wake up and live again, do they? It seems they did, in Jesus. And suddenly, everything was new and fresh, delighted to see him again. Some of the exuberance back again, ready to carry on. And of course, the evening of that first Sunday... Jesus had come into the upper room, had talked to them and said, Receive my spirit. And he'd blown on them. <sighs> Back to the wind, the spirit and the breath again. So with all of this, why couldn't the disciples just carry on? They'd experienced his spirit, they knew what Jesus wanted, they knew how he worked. They could surely have just carried on. But God wanted more than that. He didn't want them to just carry on, struggling along as they had done before. God's vision was wider than that. Not just for a breath on half a dozen people in an upper room. Not just trying to follow on the way they had done before. Not just for a few individuals here and there. But for all people at all time. Beginning locally where they were, Judea, but then Samaria and the end of the earth. This was a new beginning. This was a new movement. Today we call it Christianity, named after Christ himself. So, all in all, all this power meant, not just for individuals in a small group, not even for the 120. It was going to be different, very different. This meant that it was for men and women. Young and old, rich and poor, black and white, slave and free, Jew and non-Jew alike. For anyone and everywhere, as long as time lasted, for those who choose to accept and follow the one we call Jesus and be open to the things of God and welcome his spirit. So where does that leave you and me? About four years ago, I remember our two grandsons came to visit along with Mummy and Daddy and after the obligatory hugs and kisses which Nans and Grandpas tend to give they both made a beeline for the toy box we have here and uh, the little one, Benjamin, wanted everything out of the toy box. He wanted to collect all the toy cars and carry them through to find a spot where he could play. He wanted to do it on his own. No, he wouldn't have any help. No, he wouldn't make more than one journey. He wanted to do it all as he could. He was four, but he could manage all of them. So he managed to carry these cars, insisting, I can do it by my own, he said. And he had one under his chin and some under his armpit and hands full, struggling. And of course, the inevitable happened. First he dropped one and then another. And his little face crumpled in annoyance and disappointment. I do wonder sometimes... 
if we get a bit full like that with too much in our hands, carrying too much. I'm reminded of the Greek word that we get in the New Testament, ekonosis. It could simply be an emptying, and maybe in this time of lockdown, you've been emptying boxes and cupboards and drawers, going through, sifting through, deciding what was precious and must be kept, and deciding what, quite frankly, just had to go. I don't wonder if it's a bit like that with us and what we have, what we take responsibility for, what we insist on having and doing it. I will do it on my own. Our God is a God who wants to do extraordinary things through ordinary people. You may be saying, well, okay, tell me. Well, that very day, the day of Pentecost, the day of the power coming, we notice, first of all, Peter, a rough and ready fisherman, if ever there was one, bless him, heart of gold, with a bit all mouth and trousers, opened his mouth and put his foot in it, bless him. And yet at that moment, suddenly, inspired, he stood up and started to preach, articulate, eloquent, passionate about the things of Christ. And that 120 strong crowd grew to about 3,000 who wanted to know how they too could be ardent followers of Jesus Christ. And the other disciples likewise continued in their ways to the point where ultimately, with equanimity and without any fear, they faced crucifixion in a variety of ways and death by the sword. But of course, it didn't stop there. Because you see, we had people like St. Paul, Silas, Barnabas, Timothy, and a whole host of others who continued the work when Jesus was no longer there in a bodily form. Come forward a few hundred years, we have the German, Martin Luther. Then we have the Wesley brothers, English brothers, who began the Methodist movement. Let's come a bit, a bit nearer us, to the 20th century. I wonder if you know of the white man, the, the priest, serving in South Africa, at a time when black was black and white was white, and there the twain should meet. And yet that wasn't for him. He had God's love in his heart. He treated black and white the same with equal love and respect. So seeing a black woman and a little boy on the streets day after day, he would raise his hat and say, good morning, and stop and have a word and say a little blessing on the child. And then when the boy was ill in hospital, he would go every day to sit by his bedside, the only white face in the substandard hospital that was reserved for black people. The family never forgot the woman and little boy never forgot this man of God. The white man? Trevor Huddleston. The little black boy? Well, we know him today as Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Or perhaps you think of Jackie Pullinger, the woman who was convinced she was called to be uh, a missionary somewhere abroad, and yet no society would accept her for whatever reason. And a friendly pastor suggested that she could actually save up and buy a ticket for the, the cheapest, slow-going boat she could find that would call at many places around the world and pray God that would show her the time to get off. And that's what happened. She disembarked at Hong Kong. And it was there that she worked tirelessly with the prostitutes and those immersed in the drug culture, bringing hope and life and salvation to many. Or perhaps the midlife American Albert, dear old Albert with his battered van. He loved to lead the Christian youth group at the local church. And every time he came out, there'd be an assortment of teenagers standing around. Hey, Albert, you're going to give us a ride then in your battered old van before it conks out? And one lad said, hey, Albert, how about teaching me to drive then in your poor old van? And Albert said, OK, I'll teach you as long as you come to youth club. It was agreed. So the boy went to the youth club and Albert taught him to drive. The boy kept on going to youth club. He passed his test. He kept on going to youth club and eventually gave his life to Christ. Now I guess you won't remember Albert Smith's name in two weeks' time, but you remember the boy. He went on to become Billy Graham, the evangelist. Or perhaps the London lawyer, far too busy and far too high power to have time for Christianity. And yet the time came when he too gave his life to Christ. Nicky Gumble, we know him. We know him because he worked with Sandy, the vicar at Holy Trinity Brompton in church in London, 
We know that the two of them worked together and produced what's called the Alpha Course. God loves to do extraordinary things through ordinary people. And in other ways, people who are probably nameless now, Christians helped to set up shelter. The Samaritans, Alcoholics Anonymous, Amnesty International, even the hospice movement, all begun because a Christian somewhere was committed enough and filled by God's Spirit to do something that would make a difference. So what about you and me? Yes, you and me. Are you open and ready for God to do something extraordinary through you? Maybe you were once or you had a gentle touch of the Spirit and you think that's enough. Or maybe you look around and think, well, not me, it won't happen to me, but there's some super spiritual people about it, might be for them. Or you might say, no, I don't think God's done anything extraordinary, not since the last full stop at the end of the Bible. But God has, in all the things we've just mentioned, and wants to continue working through you. It might be something like the influence you have on a young child at church that's enough to help that child make a real difference in God's kingdom. It might be a mate at work that you pray with, or a neighbour that you chat to, or perhaps you share your faith with a stranger on the bus. Whatever it is, there's something God wants you to do for him. It's just bursting to do something extraordinary in your life. So are you open and ready? That's the big question. You see, I've been there. I'm ashamed to say it a few years ago, I had a legacy of, of hurt and anger and resentment in me from something that had happened. And I tried to deal with it, I tried to bury it, I tried to carry on going, asking God for his spirit to, to help me through. And I was vaguely aware of a little spirit now and again. It was a struggle. Till a Christian friend said, Pam, I believe there's something God wants me to say to you. I said, okay. She said, your heart is dark and God wants it to be as white as snow. It was hard to listen to, but I wasn't angry because I knew she was right. I knew God was right. In some way it had felt as though there was a blockage, and although I was asking for God's Spirit, the Spirit didn't seem to come. I was blocking the Spirit with the way my heart was. Maybe there's someone out there today in that situation. It was a lovely lady called Joyce who helped me along my road that I needed to travel. You can be helped as well. Maybe you have a sense of anger, frustration. It may be that it's given way to, to guilt and shame. You know, that can do it as well. That's how it was for Simon Peter. The guilt and shame of saying he, he didn't even know Jesus. It was blocking God's spirit. Jesus knew that, knew more than anything, Simon Peter needed to be rid of that legacy that he was struggling with. And in a one-to-one, -one, Jesus put that right. Or maybe someone today who's listening has that sense of just wanting to know absolutely that Jesus Christ is alive and real and absolutely hang everything on it. Is that you? That's how Thomas was. Unless I see the nail holes in his hands, he said, and can put my fingers there, I will not believe. Blocking the way, you see. And Jesus knew. And in that time with Thomas, Jesus sorted that for him. So that Thomas could say, My Lord and my God. Or maybe it's just that this time of lockdown has been so hard, you feel numb, despairing. You've lost hope. It was like that for the two on the road to Emmaus. They knew Jesus had died, there was no question of that, and some were suggesting that he was alive. Really? They just wondered whether they could ever get back to the way life had been, and maybe you're wishing that too. But you see, God wants us to move forward to something bigger, better and brighter. 
That's how it was for the two on the road to Emmaus. The stranger chatting to them, they hadn't recognised as Jesus, the risen Christ. But he unblocked that blockage, helped them see. And as soon as they knew, they said, oh, didn't our hearts burn within us? Burning, you see, fire. We're back to the one aspect of the Spirit coming at Pentecost. Jesus knows when there's something blocking the way. And he just wants to be able to help you as he helped me. But we need to be honest enough to say, yes, there's something blocking the way. Yes, I'm not as I should be. Lord, come and help. And if you think there might be and you're not sure, ask God to show you. God is just bursting to pour his spirit in you. He just wants to clear away any of the rubbish that's accumulated there that shouldn't be there. So I invite you to think again about the coming of the Spirit. That one touch you had years ago, you don't need to settle for that. God wants to flood you with so much more. You never thought it would be you. Yes, it can be you. God wants to share everything with you. He wants you to have life in all its fullness. God is still at work, doing extraordinary things to ordinary people. And God wants nothing more than his beautiful, passionate, deeply enriching spirit to flood through you and help you be the person he's always meant you to be. How about it? Can you and I be open anew? I'd like to finish with a, a prayer. It come, I've adapted one of the prayers from Bread of Tomorrow, this lovely book. This is the prayer. The original was written by Neil Few in 1990. Come, Holy Spirit, enter our silences and the depths of our longing. Come, Holy Spirit, our Lord and our Saviour, our lover and our friend. Come, Holy Spirit, unmask our pretending and expose our lives. Come, Holy Spirit, work through our weaknesses and warm our cold hearts. Enter our trusting, enter our fearing, enter our letting go, enter our holding back. Oh, come, Holy Spirit, wind, flame and speech, breathe, burn and speak through us. Come, Holy Spirit, embraces Fill us and set us free. Amen. God bless you. Good morning and welcome to our prayers today. And I've come upstairs, I've brought my recording equipment upstairs into one of our bedrooms because the disciples on Pentecost were in an upper room. So I thought it a fitting place to lead prayer. Also, before I start, I'd like to just share a few thoughts that I have about the Holy Spirit. My experience of the Holy Spirit has been that the Holy Spirit knows us so well and he's waiting for us to turn and, and pray and be filled. And the Holy Spirit will be gentle, will be calm, will be kind. Although at Pentecost, um, the Holy Spirit was described as wind blowing like a violent storm and tongues of fire came down on the heads of the disciples, that happens, doesn't always happen in my experience. It happens, of course it does. And maybe today we will be knocked over in our, in our homes with a violent storm or a wind of the Holy Spirit. Um, but often that's sort of an internal thing, isn't it? And also it can be very alarming that. And as I said, my experience of the Holy Spirit is something that's quiet and gentle and beautiful. Anyway, whatever we come with open hearts and open minds into prayer today. So let us pray. Oh, Father God, we thank you. We thank you that you are our Abba Father in heaven. We thank you that we've been drawn close to you in faith through Jesus Christ. Jesus, we thank you that you died, was buried and rose again that you've ascended to heaven and you're at the right hand of the Father. And we come today to your throne of grace. We come with 
open hearts, open hands. We come with everything that burdens us and everything that brings us joy. We come empty, waiting to receive from you. And we thank you, Jesus, that you taught us that without your death, without your resurrection and indeed without your ascension, we would not be able to experience the Holy Spirit. We thank you that the temple curtain was ripped asunder and we can come into the presence of the holies of holies through your spirit. Come Holy Spirit of God. Come now. And these prayers are real prayers of faith. We are not joined together in a building, but we are joined with threads of love and threads of faith and threads of hope. And so therefore I declare your word that when two or more are gathered in your name, your presence is amongst us. Come Holy Spirit, come in the gentleness, come in the storm and come in fire. Come to each one of us now, come in our need. Lord, we lay before you what needs to be laid before you. Any, any sin, any unforgiveness, any repentance, any troubles, any burdens, any wrong thoughts, anything, Lord, indeed that is not of you. We lay that down now and ask for your forgiveness. As we lay them, these things down before your throne of grace, we wait upon you, Holy Spirit. We wait upon you and ask that you would give us a fresh outpouring of your presence in our lives. A fresh outpouring over us and an infilling in us. May our very spirits within receive your Holy Spirit now. Lord, we just pray for an empowering of your Spirit and we also pray in faith for any healing, any deliverance, anything that needs to be done in our lives and in us and in our situations. Come Holy Spirit of God now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for what you're doing in us right now. Thank you, Lord, for all that you're going to do in us. And thank you that all that you're going to do through us. Lord, at the end of Acts 2, it says that the disciples went out and performed signs and wonders. Lord, may we be like the disciples. May we, may we share what we have with each other and may we also bring in your kingdom through any signs, any wonders, any miracles, any differences that we can make through the power of your Holy Spirit in us. Shape us to be more like Christ. Leaders, counsellors, give us all wisdom that comes from the Father. Holy Spirit, if there's any gifting in us that needs to be fulfilled, empowered, brought out, we pray now that that would start happening in our lives. If there's any new direction in our lives, any doors that need opening, pray Holy Spirit you would show that to us now, tomorrow and in the days ahead. May this Pentecost be a turning point. As a people, we turn out and come, start coming out of lockdown. Not completely there, Lord, but we're starting to come out. Whatever works you've been doing in our lives in the last few months, 
because we acknowledge, Lord, and we declare that all in all things you work for the good, for those who love you, who've been called according to your purpose. And in these recent days and months, many of us have experienced different things, have drawn closer to you, have seen the world in a different way, have been called to do different things. So Lord, may this your transforming power be pivotal on this day now as we pray. Come Holy Spirit of God, give us that wisdom that we need. Come Holy Spirit of God, Make us bold in what you are calling us to do as servants of the Lord Most High. Come Holy Spirit of God and speak into our hearts. Thank you. Thank you for what you are going to do in our lives. Thank you. It's exciting to pray in this way and it's exciting to look ahead to the future with hope. The hope of your promises. Of you, promises of your word. Finally, Holy Spirit, can we pray for those around us and for our nation and for the world? Can we pray that you pour out your spirit on us today, but pour out your spirit on those around us, that you pour out your spirit on our churches, you pour out our spirit, your spirit on our nation, and you pour out your spirit throughout the world. May as we pray today on Pentecost Sunday, may these prayers be joined with all our fellow believers throughout the world who are praying to see you come again, Jesus, this time in power and in glory. Lord, in this time of quiet, we bring to you all the people, the situations, the places, the countries, the nations that need your empowerment, your touch of your spirit, Lord. So we bring them to you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Come Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for your church. We thank you that we are part of that church. And we pray that in the coming days and months that your church, as, it, as we come out of lockdown, will be a revived church. It'll be refueled in ways that we can't imagine quite now when we're still in our homes. So we pray now for that. And we pray for the hearts of the people of our nation that as doors are opened, many of them will come and walk through the doors of your churches and Lord, we will be equipped to receive them. And Lord, in this time we can't not stop and pray for your blessing, your extra portion of blessing and healing over those people who are suffering from COVID-19, over blessing over those people who are particularly working directly with them to heal and help and restore those who can be saved. And Lord, for those who are going to be with you, we pray your blessing over them. We pray for those grieving. And we thank you that in our world we have so many people who do work alongside you, Lord, healing and helping those in need. Thank you, Lord, that you are gracious. Thank you for your love. May your banner of love just pour out over these prayers that we offer this morning. And may your banner of love fill us as we go out to do the work of your kingdom. So as we conclude our prayers in the name of Jesus, I want to finish with the blessing. 
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face upon you and give you his grace and his favour. May the Lord lift his countenance to you and give you his peace. Jesus, we honour you through our prayers. Jesus, you are our Prince of Peace. Jesus, we thank you for walking with us every day of our lives. Amen and Amen. God bless you this week. Take care.